All right. If you wish to follow along, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 12. Now, over time, I'll probably will have eventually read all this chapter, but I will not do so this morning. But the reason I wanted you to read over this chapter was at least to familiarize your mind <coughs> with what is said here. <coughs> But for this morning, I want to read just two verses. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. Listen to what God said to Israel through Moses. He said, Take heed to thyself, that thou offer not thy burnt offerings in every place that thou seest, but in the place which the Lord shall choose, in one of thy tribes, there thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, and there thou shalt do all that I command thee. Amen. What we have in Deuteronomy chapter 12 is the law of the central altar. God was telling Israel that in his time, and it wasn't so right then, right then they God was meeting with them in the tabernacle as the tabernacle moved all about. But God said there will become a time when I will choose a place and there and there only will you worship me. Amen. And that's what he's saying. And let me just say, that was never completely fulfilled in history. For if Jesus, Hebrew says, and it's actually an unfortunate translation, for if Joshua had given them rest, they would not have afterward, God would not have afterward spoken of another day. That's right. So just remember that. Yeah. Because while this had historical reality yes, sir. and historical meaning, it was pointing to something, yea, someone far greater than these things themselves. Exactly. And let me tell you, listen, this idea cooked up by some premillennialists that somehow since this wasn't for fulfilled to Israel as a people and as a nation, that will then someday Christ will come again and then will restore all of this for Israel is a lie. Yeah, right. Those sacrifices are done. Amen. Exactly. They're done. Yeah. Amen. Those that eat at that altar, anytime, back then, yeah. now, or even in the future, they have no right to eat at the altar that we eat at. Exactly. That's it. That's what the book of God says according to the new covenant. Yes, sir. Now, as I said, this is the chapter containing the law of the central altar. But my title for this morning is The Singularity of the Central Altar. Yes, That's the first thing I want to try to zero in on. Now I have to, or I want to, I do feel I have to lay a little bit of ground rule here and some facts. First of all, <coughs> this central altar was not central geographically. You find that if you read verses 20 and 21. God said, as you go into the land and you expand, you begin to conquer this area and you expand, it will eventually get to the point where some of you are too far away to get to the central altar. Isn't that what he says? You've read it. If you read it, you see that. The central altar, even here, and even at, as it was first ordained, and I don't have it all, and I didn't, it, all of that, all of the history of that in itself don't matter. It first was established as Shiloh. Yeah. Then it finally came and God said, Jerusalem now is where it will be. But all of that is shadow of something greater. Exactly. But it was never central geographically. It is central by theocratic sovereign choice. Yes. That's why it's central. That's how it's central. Yeah. It's central because God says, here's where it's at. Exactly. This is the center of worship, there and there only. Yeah. 
Amen. And we read that in verse 4 and 5. Ye shall not do so unto the Lord your God. Of the preceding three verses of instruction, which God willing we'll talk about later. But unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there. Even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither shalt thou come, and thither ye shall bring your burnt offerings, and your sacrifices, and your tithes, and your heave offerings of your hand, and your vows, and your free will offerings, and the firstlings of your herds, and of your flocks, and there shall ye eat before the Lord your God, and ye shall rejoice in all that ye put your hands unto, ye and your households, wherein the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. So it's central, again remember, by theocratic sovereign choice. God says, this is what I choose. This is the way it is. Deal with it. Or as Joe said, or don't. <laughs> but if you bow not, not down to God's theocratic sovereign choice, then you're not bowing down to God. Right. Exactly it is rebellion against God. Yeah, exactly. This is clear from the context. Historically, and even more so in its, in its true fulfillment. So first of all, it's not central geographically. It is central by theocratic sovereign choice. And remember what Paul said about all this. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Remember, I'm laying the groundwork now. So that we properly understand this chapter. When we read this chapter, think of the historical events as a mind picture. Yeah. A picture painted for us so that we might, in our inability to grasp Mason the infinite, God describes the infinite through finite things. Yes, he shadowed them through finite things so that we might have some ability, Joe, to grasp a hold of what God's talking about exactly. in eternal matters. And this is what Paul, this is the way the Apostle Paul put it in chapter 10 and verse 1. For the law having a shadow. Yeah. Do you see that? Having a shadow. Now, first of all, all of the law is not a shadow. No. You're right. The law has a shadow. Having a shadow. Some things in the law are shadow. When God says, thou shalt not steal, that's not a shadow for something else. Exactly. You're right. Yeah. When God says, thou shalt not commit adultery, that's not a shadow for something else. You're right. You're right. That law was given to show us how corrupt we really are. Right. Because when it says, thou shalt not, it didn't say, you ought not. Yeah. It says, thou shalt not. Yeah. All of them says, shalt not, don't it? That's right. Yeah. Or thou shalt. Yeah. And when you don't, it's sin against God. Yeah. Exactly. And we still don't. Amen. We still don't. Look, for the law having a shadow of good things to come. So the law, in its shadow, and even in its reality, pointed there's got to be something better, something different. Exactly. When it says thou shalt not steal, that shuts me down. Yes, sir. Because you steal one time, and you're doomed before God. Exactly. It doesn't say thou shalt not steal a whole lot. Yeah. Thou shalt make restitution when thine stealeth. Nope. Thou shalt not steal. Amen. But what we're reading here is shadow. Yeah. Why? Because the book of Hebrews says all of those offerings and sacrifices were figures and shadows. So I know when I read this, that's what it's talking about. Yes, sir. But what's it saying? Look, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things. Now that's important to remember. Yes, sir can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually and where did they have to go to do it? To the central altar. Yes, sir. Which they offered year by year they could never make the uh, comers therein too perfect. And then look at the summary at verse 9. Then said he this is speaking of Christ, lo I come to do thy will. Joe you adequately preached on that. Oh God he taketh what's that say? <coughs> He taketh away the first. Yeah. That, therefore the first has to be taken away. It's yeah. got to be gone. Why? That he may establish the second. You see it? Now think about this. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 shows us this. These things shadow 
That is, they cast an outline. You know what a shadow is. The shadow doesn't give you all the details. It's just an outline. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? That's, right. you under, that's why the word is trans. It's, it's a decent translation of the word. The, the things, these things shadow Christ. Yeah. They shadow his gospel. Yeah. They shadow his people. And they shadow the worship of God in Christ. Yeah. That's the first thing about Hebrews 10.1. Here's the second thing. This shows us this. Do not confound the issue by trying to fit every word of Deuteronomy 12 as shadow, for, it's the, for the shadow is not the very image of the things. Exactly. Do you understand what I'm saying here? That's right. Yeah. Compare it. Hebrews 1 says Christ is the very image of the invisible God. Amen. The very image. Yes, yes. But in the law, in the shadows, yeah. in the figures, in the types, they are not the very image of the things. In other words, here's the thing to do first. Look for the apparent concepts of the new covenant as is shadowed in the old covenant. Look for what's apparent first. Don't read through, if you read it more and read through Deuteronomy chapter 12 or any of the other shadows and types and figures and try to make every word fit. Yeah. You'll just confound yourself. Exactly. How does that fit? It probably does, but be careful because as one fellow said, we don't have to teach how every board in the ark defines Christ. Yeah. But we know that every board in the ark <coughs> defines Christ. That's exactly right. But God gives us a picture of the ark as a whole. Exactly. And that's what he's given us here, a picture of the central altar as a whole. So that's what I want to point out. Look for the apparent concepts, truths, or more adequately, truth of the new covenant in the shadow of the old covenant first. We do not have to define Christ in, as I said, every single little word. It's not like an epistle where you need to take every little single word yeah. exactly as it says. Because if you try to do that with types or more the, the, uh, the, the word used in Hebrews 10.1, it's a shadow. You're, you're just getting the outline and you're going to confound yourself. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I have read some really good books by men who talked about shadows and types and they can be very good but they also can get so mundane and boring because they're trying to make everything fit exactly. the thing about it is you don't look at the old covenant and then teach the new covenant in light of the old covenant you look at the new covenant and then when you see the types and the shadows then you'll see things open up for you that's right exactly Christ is the central altar. Amen. Amen. Anybody who thinks anything else, you're just dead wrong. Exactly. I mean, don't prejudice your mind against that. That's just the facts. That's it. It's the way it is. As I said, look for the apparent, the things that just jump right out of the page at you. Now, someone may say, I read that, nothing jumped out of the page at me. Well, I hope that's not the case. But sometimes, I mean, I know this was brought to my attention, and no, I didn't come up with it. This was in here thousands of years. Exactly. So there ain't nobody here come up with it. Exactly. <laughs> but it was brought to my attention, and I read that chapter, and, and all of a sudden, some things just jumped right out. There you go. Man. Man. Because think of this. No one sees it all, all the time. No, you're right. No one does. Even all of those books, Shadows of Christ, they're not going to see it all, all the time. And even if someone, Joe, could write a book and show it all, all the time, we're not going to get it all, all the time. <laughs> I've read this chapter, I don't know how many times, and it just didn't jump out like it did this time. Exactly. You know, that's God's business. No one sees it all, all the time. But Hebrews 10 and 9 now gives the proper perspective of approach. Yes, sir. He taketh away the first, that he might establish the second. Therefore, look at the second, mm -hmm. yeah. 
And then the first will show some shadow to you. Exactly. Some figure to you. Don't look at the old one. Don't look at the first one and say, now I've got to make the truth of Christ fit into that. No, sir. No. Take the New Testament and what it teaches about the person and work of Jesus Christ. Then you'll see some of the types and the shadows and the figures boldly stand out yes, sir. in the types and the figures. And as I said, let me go back to Hebrews and let me, let me read that. Hebrews chapter 1. And think about this. God who at sundry times and in divers manner spake in past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Amen. Do you see it? Yeah. Now he's not saying what the prophets said is of no value. Uh -huh. But he's saying here's the paramount, paramount person. The word of God himself has come in human flesh. Yeah. And what he said, <laughs> everything else is taken in light of what he said. Amen. Don't take everything else and then say, well, I've got to fit what Christ said into that. No, what he said is. Yes. What he yes. taught yes. is. And then go back and look at the types and the figures and the prophecies. Then you'll begin to see the proper perspective. So much so that the writer Paul then says in what we have as chapter 2, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have what? Heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by who? You want to get down to the meat of the thing, spoken by the Lord. Amen. Because he is the one who speaks for God in the last day. Yes, sir. He is the prophet he is the priest, and he is the king. Amen. And that is, as the prophet, I'm going to boil it all down. That means he speaks for God to us. Yep. If you ever hear from God, you'll hear through Jesus Christ, or you won't hear from God. Amen. He's the prophet. He's the priest. He goes to God for us. Amen. And if he doesn't go to God for you, you'll never get to God. Exactly. And he is the king. What he says goes. It's as simple. What he says goes. Prophet, priest, and king. Look, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord, listen, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. So somebody said, well, I'm just going to listen to Jesus. I ain't listening to anybody else. You're playing games. You're trying to give yourself an out. God has ordained men who speak for him and they're speaking what Christ said and not their own opinion and when they're speaking what Christ said you better listen to them. Amen. You better listen to them. And was confirmed unto us by them that heard him God also bearing them witness. So and I will tell you if I'm up here preaching what these apostles taught from this book, yep. you better listen to it as the very word of God himself. You know why? Because it is. So much so that John and 1 John says it's this way. People who don't hear us, yeah. they're not hearing God. That's exactly right. If they're of the world, they'll go listen to the world and what the world teaches. Amen. If they're of God, they'll listen to what God's men preach. Because God's men are preaching God's book. What it? Somebody says you're faulty. So were the apostles. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. But if I'm preaching this book, Joe, there is no fault. Exactly. There is no fault. Yeah. And here's what you do. Here's what you do if you're spiritually noble. You search these things daily yeah. in this book to see if what Joe's saying and if what I'm saying is in the book. Amen. And remember, what we have to say is in light of the new covenant, not the old, because he taketh away the first, yes. that he might establish the second. Amen. So in other words, here's the third thing. We do not define the new covenant by the old covenant. That's right. The old covenant is for shadow only. That's all it ever was. Yes, sir. This wasn't God's attempt. Yeah. To 
bless Israel, but Israel wouldn't, and that's how it's kind of supposed to be a symbol of how well, but now he's spiritually doing this for us, but then one day he's going to then go back and he'll really do it right for Israel the second time. That's a premillennialist lie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Every person who's ever been blessed of God has been blessed by Jesus Christ or they're not blessed at all. That's right. That's just the way it is. And that's the way it's always that's the way it always has been. It's the way it always was. Adam and Eve, who came and visited them in the garden after they fell? Yeah. It says the voice of the Lord. Amen. Who's that? Exactly. That's Jesus Christ. Amen. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and God said, build an ark. Who's that? That's Jesus Christ. Amen. The Israelites drank water from a rock. Who was that? Yeah. That was Jesus Christ. Amen. It's always been Christ. And in the Old Testament, you will find direct prophecies concerning Jesus Christ, yes, or you will find figures and types and shadows. That's exactly right. But remember, don't ever define the new covenant by the old covenant. You just look at the old covenant as shadow. Exactly. The new covenant is defined by the doctrine of Christ, the mediator. He is the one who in his last days spoke for God. Yes, sir. And he has other men. He's gone now. And he has other men endued with power from the Holy Spirit. And what does that mean? That don't mean I get up here and I shout and I uh and all that. It means you speak the truth of God. Right. It means you preach this book yeah. in light of the new covenant with Jesus Christ as the mediator of the new covenant. And when you do, you're hearing God speak. Yes, sir. Yeah. That's right. That's, true. That's how important this is. Christ says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So if I'm speaking his words, what's that mean being spoken? That's it. Spirit and life. Yes, sir. Now here's the thing. If you don't see God's word as life, then that means you're dead. Because the gospel is life unto life. Yes, it's a savor of life unto life. But the gospel is also a savor of death unto those that are dead. Exactly. I don't like what you say. What I say is Jesus Christ. Amen. What I'm trying to preach, who I'm trying to preach is Jesus Christ. And people can dislike me oh, yeah. and my personality, but if they dislike who I'm preaching, they have the problem. Exactly. They are refusing to worship God at the central altar. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. That's it. And, out of, and he's gone now. And as God is my witness. Especially when I first met Earl Cochran, I didn't like every, everything in every way that Earl Cochran did things. I was 22, 23 years old. He was retired. He had a lot more wisdom than I did, and I didn't like that. It was hard to deal with. But you know what? He put up with me. Huh? Even... Ask me to stand behind this podium. Yes, sir. Hmm? And what? Even more who he was preaching, who he was preaching resonated with my soul to where all of those personal peccadillos did not matter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They are but specks of dust in the wind. Right. But for a person whom the personal peccadillos matter to where they don't even want to hear someone preaching the truth. They got the problem, not the person preaching the truth. Because we all got our problems and our peccadillos. And you just mark that. But I ain't listening to no man. You'll listen. You'll hear God through one of his God-ordained means, or you don't hear God at all. As I said, you and I are not Abrams. Exactly. He didn't come and change our name. My name's still Walter. Abraham is the father of us all. We're not the father of anybody. Exactly. Now think about that for a while. Yeah. Why did he use that phrase? Because Abraham had a distinct place, Joe. Yes, he did. Yeah. So then, <clears throat> so then, with that in mind, remember, <laughs> remember this. Don't look at the shadow and then try to make the New Testament fit into the shadow. It fits. Oh yeah. That's it right. fits. 
But the shadow is not the very image of the thing. Take the things of the new covenant, then go back and read the shadows and types, and then things will open up for you. Yes, and you'll see things that will bless your soul. If you do it the other way, you'll confound yourself. Yeah, that's right. You'll be fighting the proverbial losing battle. Yeah. I know. I've been there. I've been there. So then what I want to do is to highlight some of the apparent things. So here's my title again. Remember the singularity of the central altar. What is God saying in Deuteronomy 12? There's going to be one place you worship me. Yep, that's right. And to jump ahead, even in things of liberty and even in things of providence, yes. if you can't make it there, yeah. there's still some ground rules. That's right. You don't partake of the blood. That's right. Because the blood's mine, God says. Yes, sir. That's right. You don't need, now, you, if you're too, you're too far away, you can even eat the meat yeah. that was supposed to be offered to God at the central altar. But you take the blood, just like you would a heart or a roebuck, and you pour it out upon the earth. You know what? Because the blood is God's. Amen. God didn't, Christ didn't offer his blood to us. That's right. See, I'm getting ahead of myself. Christ offered his blood to God. Amen. But then the mediator of the new covenant, yeah. the one who took away the first that he might establish the second, comes along and says, my flesh is meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed and you've got to drink my blood. Can you imagine? Those, many of those old Jews knew this law of the central altar. Oh, yeah. You don't drink any blood. That's right. And Christ comes along, Ellen, and says, now you will drink my blood. Yeah. Hmm? See, he stands because he is the central altar. Amen. He is, and now it's not like the old covenant. No. They couldn't come. Yeah. They had to have a priest come do it for them. Right. We can right. enter into the very presence of God, come to the throne of grace. Yeah. Yes, boldly. Amen. The veil was rent. Yes. Right? So that lets us know the new covenant is far superior because the new covenant is about the true central altar. Yes, sir. He is what it all really pointed to, Amen. what it all really means. So let's get right to it. The central altar is vital and it's singular. We already read it. Look at Don't do it in any place other than the place I choose. Amen. Isn't that what he says? Yeah. Now let's just I sum it all up. No need to go back and read it again. Verse, I will read verse 28. Look at what he says. Observe and hear all these words which I command thee, that it may go well with thee. That's right. Yeah. Uh, uh, wait a minute. Not just with thee yeah. and with thy children after thee. Well, it's all in God's hands. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to criticize anybody about anything. Then you don't know about the singularity of the central altar. Jump ahead a moment. Already, what's the first thing he told them to do when they went into the land? Yeah. Read verses 1, 2, and 3. Yeah. You become iconoclasts. Yeah. You break down everybody else's altars. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you where to set up mine. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. And I remember Earl talking about the one man that said, well, you're an iconoclast. You know what it means? You take what other people believe and you shove it in the dirt and you grind it to powder and say it's worthless. No, it's more than that. It's as it says here, it's an abomination in God's sight. That's what it says. Amen. The preaching of the gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ is not a live and let live proposition. No way. Mm -mm. And let me tell you something. When it comes to the worship of God, yeah. there you go. even in things of liberty and in things of Providence, yeah. even hindering providence, there's still ground rule. Jesus Christ is to be honored no matter what. Amen. That's it. No matter what. Paul says somebody takes some meat and they've offered it to, to an idol. He said, you can eat that meat. It means nothing. But if they tell you this is offered to an idol and they don't know the truth of it, he said, you abstain from that for their sake. Exactly. Because Christ is not to be dishonored no matter what. You see what I'm saying? Do you see what Paul's saying? See how, and it's right here. Joe, it's all right here in this one little chapter. It's amazing. 
The central altar is vital because he says, Observe and hear all these words which I command thee, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee forever when thou doest that which is good and right in the sight of the Lord thy God. It's good to brag on Jesus Christ. Amen. We talk about preaching Christ, but what is preaching Christ? It's bragging about Him. Yeah. It's talking about who He is and what He's done. And that is a sweet savor to God, whether it's to death or to life. Right, yeah. one. That honors God, no matter whether you're preaching to someone who's elect mm -hmm. or reprobate. Yes, sir. That's a sweet savor to God. Yeah. Do you see it? That's what the book teaches. That's what Paul went on to say. To so some were a savor of life and the life, and to others were a savor of death and the death. But it's always the proclamation, the bragging about Jesus Christ is always a sweet savor to God. Amen. And uh, go ahead and tear down their altars. Yes, sir. It's not just all right. It's the way it's supposed to be. And we'll look at that. Yeah. You remember, people said, but Walter needs to be a little kinder. I can't be no kinder than what I am right now. Because I tell you, when you preach the truth of Christ, it ain't about kindness. It's about the truth of God. You remember Christ came along and he said, you've heard them say, and he just had mentioned the Pharisees. Oh, yeah. You've heard them say, and he says what they said. Yeah. Took it, took their little idols, Joe, and ground it into powder. Oh, yeah. You've heard them say, but I say unto you. Right, exactly. Hmm? That's how important this thing is. The central altar is vital. Amen. Who it is, the teaching that surrounds it, how you conduct yourself concerning it, yes, even if you're providentially hindered or if it's things of liberty. Yeah. You, could, you could take that. You said, uh, thou shalt care that it's too far away from you. You can kill the herd of that flock and you can eat the parts of it that was supposed to have been given to God. Just like you would a heart or a roebuck. Remember what he says? Yeah. But still yet. There, here's this one singular rule. You pour the blood out. No matter what, because that's God's. Life's in the blood, and life is God's. All life, physical life, animal life, spiritual life, whatever it is, it's God's. God gives it, God takes it away. Yes, sir. It's His. It's His. Spiritual life, He gives it, and Joe, thank God, He never takes it away. Amen. Uh, never takes it away. So then the central altar is vital. In other words, the central altar is vital because God's ordained the worship of himself in this way. God said, the place that I choose and the way that I choose, because you see the way in some of the rest of the book. There, when you brought these offerings, you didn't just do it the way you wanted to. There were certain pieces of choice meat that went to God. Yes, sir. Right? Yes, sir. Now, other parts could be eaten by the priest. Oh. Other parts could be eaten by the actual people themselves, the, yes, the, the, the offerer. And they brought it to the priest. The priest, but there were certain parts, Joe, it went to God. And the fat, it's God's. It's God's. Yeah, it's all right, folks. Listen, God likes fat. There you go. Now, you take that as far as you want to take it. God likes fat. I'm being silly. But don't feel so bad about yourself. The fat was God's, Joe. Yes, sir. The feast is called the feast of what? Yeah. Fat thing. And Christ is fatness before God. Amen. Hmm? He is. Now think about this. So God has ordained the worship of himself, and his way is vital. You remember what that woman at the well said to Christ first? I perceive you're a prophet. And then she wanted to engage God Almighty. She didn't know it, but she wanted to engage God Almighty in a religious argument. Yes, that's exactly You right. Jews say you ought to worship down there in Jerusalem. That's what they're talking about. Yep, that's right. The central altar. They say, we, we say worship up in this mountain. Jesus said to her, woman, you worship, you know not what. Exactly. Do, you see her, do you see him obeying verses 1, 2, and 3? Yeah. Taking her place of worship and grinding it into powder. It ain't no good. Exactly. Because those that worship God must worship God in spirit and in truth. They Amen. must. Yes. Not it's the best. No. Observe and hear all these words which I command, but that it may go well with thee. You reject the central altar, you'll perish. Because the central altar is Christ. Amen. The central altar is Christ. That's what she even came to realize. When it finally dawned on her by the grace of God, and she ran back down to her uh, folks. Well, one of her, one of her many husbands. Well, it wasn't his husband, was it? She's shacking up with this one. And she runs back to town. What would she say? I found out we ought to go to Jerusalem and worship. 
Is that what she said? No. Ah, well, she had just been confronted by the mediator of the new covenant, and she said, I have found him. Amen. The one that the prophets spoke of. And she became a true worshiper, Joe, of Jesus Christ and of God. Because, let me tell you, Christ is the place where God chose to put his name. Amen. Christ yeah. is the habitation of God. Amen. We have witnesses who testified to this. What did Christ himself say? You don't honor the Son, yeah. you don't honor the Father. John Amen. chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Sure. You dishonor the Son, what do you do? Dishonor you dishonor the Father. You will worship God in Christ or you don't worship God at all. Exactly. Yeah. That's just the way it is. What did, what did Paul say? In 1 Corinthians 3 and 11, other foundation can no man lay than that which he is laid. Amen. And what is that foundation? Well, we believe election. Make sure you know about election. Amen. No, he says, other than Jesus Christ. Amen. That's where it's at. And if you believe him, then all that other stuff will start falling in line, Joe. Yeah. Because why? Because he said this true. Yeah. And if I believe him, then I'm going to believe what he says. Exactly. That's it. Exactly. And, and if, and if I, I say I, I want to, I believe in him, but you know I don't believe everything he said. You don't get it. <laughs> you just don't get it. Yeah. You think you do. Oh, yeah. You think you're honoring God, but no, you're going to honor the Son. Yes, sir. If you're going to honor the Father, He's the central altar. Paul says, so, "The other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid." And then take heed how you build, because everything we do as believers is built on that foundation. Some of our works will suck. They'll burn. They'll burn up. That's what it says. Yeah. Mason, there'll be they're wood, hay, and stubble. Yeah. But some of them are gold, silver, and precious stones. <laughs> because thank God, He works in us both the will and the do of His good pleasure. Amen. When we truly brag on Christ in truth, God rejoices in it. Yes, sir. God is pleased with it. Neil, when those people in figure four, when they brought those sacrifices to that central altar, God was pleased. God was worshipped. He was worshipped in doing that. Why? Because they were obeying what God said. And he said, you do it there and no place else. Now, if you went anywhere else, it was an abomination to God. No matter how close you was in everything else that you did. Exactly. Because it's a central. God says, there's where I'm going to put my name. There's my habitation. There is where you worship me. Nowhere else. We have, we have the, the very testimony of God the Father through Paul. He said Christ is the head of the church. And in all things, he has the what? Preeminence. Amen. Paul said, you know, all... all all my former life and even what I'm doing now, I forget those things that are behind. That's right. And I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. And what is it? To be found in Him. Yeah. Not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, yeah. but that righteousness which is through the faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's where it says. That's what Paul said yes, sir. in Colossians. He said that in all things Christ might have the preeminence. Why? For it pleased the Father. That in him should all fullness dwell. There's our central altar. Amen. Jesus Christ. What about Moses? Je Jesus said these words about what Moses wrote. Even Moses. We're reading Moses. Deuteronomy 12. He said, if you believe Moses, you'd believe me. Amen. Because Moses wrote of me. Amen. And in Deuteronomy 12, Moses was writing of Christ. Amen. That's what he was doing. That's what he was doing. And the Apostle John, it's so, so central, or so singular, so vital is this central altar that the Apostle John in 2 John verses 9, 10, and 11 says, a man comes to you, and he doesn't bring you the doctrine of Christ. You don't even bid him a good day, and you don't let him in your house. Right. Is that what John said or not? Yeah. That's what he said, doesn't he? Yeah. Because you don't abide in the doctrine of Christ, you transgress. Exactly. You know what he says? It's not about getting along. Now, no, we can't go out and physically tear down everybody else's stuff, Joe. Yeah. But we're to do it by bragging on Jesus Christ and telling the truth about their lies. Yeah. Yeah. And if somebody doesn't like that, when I stand here in this place, 
or in some in God's providence has someone asked me a question and I give them a straightforward answer if they're offended by that and want to hurt me or harm me that's in God's hands yes sir so be it. Oh, God help us not to back off because of it. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I can see John the Baptist. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, you bunch of snakes? <laughs> Boy, oh, John was just so kind, wasn't he? <laughs> and y'all think that I'm mean? Yeah, I say, y'all, some people have actually said that. Walter needs to be more kind. You know why? Because they've got some hatred for God's truth deep down in there that hadn't been dealt with yet. That's what it's all about. Now, you want to criticize me because you see me out there somewhere and I got angry at somebody? You're right. Yeah, there you go. But when we're preaching Christ, Joe, when we're witnessing to the person and the work of Jesus Christ, let the chips fall where they may. That's, the, that's just the way it is. I, 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 there's a lot of things about me that I wish were better, but they're just not. Yeah. And I've personally, Mason, I've been this way even preaching the gospel for about 33 years now. I don't see that's going to change a whole lot. I'm not going to get up here and tell everybody that comes in here, I just love you. <laughs> because I may not even like you, let alone tell you I'm going to love you. There are people out here think you're supposed to like people before you even know them. How can you do that? Well, the law says love your neighbor as yourself. That's right. And you know what? I don't love myself. There you go. The old covenant taught me to love myself and to love my neighbor like I love myself. Because the old covenant's built upon righteousness before God. The new covenant comes along and makes you cry out, Oh, wretched man that I am. The new covenant, even for people that were way back before the new covenant, was actually established by the mediator of the new covenant. And one of them said, I've seen you, I've heard of you by the hearing of my ears, but now might I see thee. Wherefore, boy, I just love myself. Uh uh. Wherefore, I hate myself. I repent in dust and ashes. Amen. Do you see the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant? The old covenant is but a shadow. That's right. At best. And it's shadows, it's just shadows. It's just figures, it's just types. And when God says, love your neighbor as yourself, you can't. <laughs> because we don't even love ourselves for the right reasons yeah. do we what we love is more of our lust and our passions and our depravities that's what we really love and that ain't the kind of love God's talking about there you see what I'm saying mm. aren't you glad he taketh away the first that he may establish the second uh, uh, aren't you glad that the person and work of Christ is much clearer than even all these old types of shadows? Yes, sir. Huh? You see what I'm saying? He, the, the New Testament just lays it right out who he was and what he did. Yes, sir. Doesn't it? It lays it right. It's not in code. You don't have to have Da Vinci to help you out with it. Exactly. What you have to have is the power of the Spirit of God Almighty. God has to breathe life into you, spiritual life in you. And when he does, the New Covenant will start to open up to you. If it doesn't, and if you don't begin then eating his flesh and drinking his blood, then you've got no life in you. Because people, people who are alive, they see that and they say, that's food indeed, and that's drink indeed. Exactly. Don't they? Yeah. So there's our witnesses. So think about it. Go back sometime. Read it. Read it again. Chapter 12, verses 5, 6, and 7. Read it again. And think of it this way. God chose Christ as the place. Yes, sir. God put his name there yeah. in Christ. Christ is God's habitation. Yes. He's it first. Yeah. Where his habitation, that's where God, his habitation, that's where God is. That's right. Remember God said, I'll dwell between, between the cherubims. Mason, the Shekinah glory of God wasn't a type. That was the very presence of the invisible God sitting right there between those two cherubims right on top of that mercy seat that lid on that box. That's what's called the Shekinah glory. It was the very glory of God. You remember Ezekiel seeing it? And it was, what he could see was marvelous, wasn't it? What he could see was marvelous. But he couldn't see the real essence. All of it was still, Mason, given in these earthly finite things manifested, wasn't it? Christ is God's habitation. That's where God is. You miss Christ, you've missed God. Exactly. 
Amen. That's what I'm trying to say. God is found and approached only in Christ. He says, that's where you come. That's where you come only. You go there. And you, go, you eat there. And you eat there only. Right? That, that's what you do. That's where it's at. In, in Christ. Only in Christ do we find what pleases God. The things of worship. Yes, sir. The things of worship. Right? All of your heave offerings. Your free will offerings. Your, the things of your hand. Your tithes. Your sacrifices. Your burn all. All of it. That kind of sums it all up, Joe. It's going to be done in that one place. And that's it. Amen. In Christ and upon Christ only do we feast and rejoice. Go back and read those verses again. Paul says we don't have any confidence in the flesh. And where do we rejoice? One place only. In Christ Jesus. Isn't that what he says? Isn't that what the new covenant teaches? We rejoice in Christ. This, and this gets the unregenerate more than anything that all we do is constantly try to talk about Christ. Ellen, even when we're talking about something else, it always eventually reverts right back to somehow the person, the work of Christ. You talk like there's nothing else to talk about other than Christ. There's not. If you're talking about marriage between a man and a woman, the best way to see how that is, look at the person, the work of Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. That's what, that's what it says. That's where it's at. Yeah. Right? If you want to see, Joe, how to live your everyday life, look at the person, the work of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that will truly encourage you to do so. It's the only thing. That's it. Mm. There's the only place that we feast and rejoice. There in Christ is God's blessings. Thus we see this. It's singular to God. It's also singular for man. In other words, there are no exceptions here. There are things of providence and things of liberty, but there's still no exceptions. The central altar is always still honored. Amen. As the central altar. You read that chapter. You see. It's always honored as the central altar. You never have the right to say. But I'm just tired of making that trip. Yeah. I ain't talking about coming here. But it would include coming here. If you really love Christ. Yes sir. Yeah. Hmm? And if it's too far away. You know what you still think about. I wish I could be there. Exactly. Hmm? Hmm? I wish I could be there. See, it's a singular to God and it's singular for man. All blessing and all who are blessed are blessed there and there only. Now, I will read this in closing. Verse 7, and there shall ye eat before the Lord your God. Amen. You see it? There, there only shall you eat before the Lord your God. If you're outside, you're, you can't make it, you're not eating before the Lord there. You're just eating that, you're eating that calf or that lamb just like you'd eat a heart or a roebuck. Yeah. You see? It has no special significance other than this. You take its blood and you pour it on the earth. That's right. You see that? Go back and read that again. There shall ye eat before the Lord your God, and ye shall rejoice in all that ye put your hand unto. What? There. Now, outside of there, ain't nothing else to rejoice in, is there? Exactly. But whatever you're doing, and it's there, if it's about the person and work of Jesus Christ, it's a good thing. Amen. It's a good thing. It ain't about, we don't have to brag about it. Brag about him. That's the good thing. Yes, sir. You don't brag about bragging about him. You just brag about him. <laughs> That's, now, I'm sure we do sometimes brag about bragging about him. But that ain't where it's at, Mason. It's just bragging about him. <clears throat> Ye and your households. Yeah. There are no exceptions. Well, but you know, I just don't want to be hard on this person. No, that's truly being unkind when you compromise the truth of Jesus Christ yeah. just because you don't want to hurt some feelings. Yeah. You're playing games with men and women's souls. Yeah. Lay it out. This is the way it is. And you don't want to be around me because of it? Fine. I'm going to Jerusalem. That's right. it. I'm going to Jerusalem. You want to stay, that's fine. Well, you know, I can't make it to Jerusalem, but I'll still honor Jerusalem. Where that altar's at. Now, I'm speaking of Christ now. You see what I'm saying? Speaking of Christ now. That's where it's at. All, again I say, all blessing and all who are blessed are blessed there. 
Verse, eight, what is it? 18 and 19. But thou must eat them before the Lord thy God in the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. You, your son, you, your son, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, and the Levites. Everybody. Yes, sir. No exceptions. That's right. Right? Everybody, take, verse 9, take heed to thyself that thou forgettest not the Levite as long as thou livest upon the earth. Even the Levite. That's right. Especially the Levite. That's what it says. What, what's he saying? Well, just this. There's a lot more there than what I'm giving you. I know. But here's the matter. No exceptions. That's the main point. If you miss that point, it don't matter if you can make it all fit. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. He said there are no exceptions. Well, you know, God maybe got a couple secret folk out no. there. No, it don't work that way. No. God don't do any of his work and it stay in the corner. He might start in the corner, Mason, oh. with nobody else around, but then God's going to show it forth to the world. Yes, sir. And the world will despise it right now. But one day in the end, they'll recognize, oh, these are trophies of God's grace through Jesus Christ. And they'll be made to bow down and confess that. Hmm. Look at what the, one more, one more here. Again, verse 28, I then read it. Observe and hear all these words which I command thee, that it may go well with thee and with your children. Oh, God help us. You know that? God help us. Because how often we have fallen short of that. You see, if there's any fault, the fault lays at our gate, not God's. Let's remember that. And you know what? I cannot change the past, Joe. And I cannot control the future or even the present. That's right. But oh, God control me. Amen. Oh, yeah. God control me. Yeah. Mm. I didn't, don't, just don't pray for God to help you have self-control. It won't work. Yeah. Self-control don't even work when you get old. You got to wear diapers. Yeah. Now take that one for as far as it goes. Oh, God, control me. And you know what? God, forgive me. Amen. Mm, never forget that one, because that one's always going to be necessary. Yes, oh, God, forgive me. Because why? It's there. It's, that, it's at that central altar that we worship God. And even if we can't be right there with it, we're still to honor it, Joe. And even in things of liberty, we're still to honor that central altar. Right? Yes, sir. Now, let me just give you, God willing, here's the title for next week. For this week, uh, Paul, it's the singularity of the central altar. Now I'm going to get mean. <coughs> next week we're going to look at the central altar dictates attacking abomination. Yes, sir. The central altar dictates attacking abomination. That's the way he actually starts out. Oh, yeah. yeah. Chapter 12, look at verses 1, 2, and 3. Huh? It dictates it. Attack the abominations. Hmm? Hmm, and I've got to stop there. I'll go to preaching that one. Father, <coughs> teach us these things. Oh, God, forgive us of our sins. Our utter failures and our wrong choices. But God, lead, guide, and direct us by your sovereign power and your sovereign mercy and compassion. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen.